and him. Respected elders, brothers and sisters, and my fellow colleagues, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you all to today's discussion on the end of the universe, organized by the Astronomy Subcommittee of the Debating Society of Husseini Madrasa. Before we begin, we would like to bless this occasion with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Brother Murtaza Banji. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء قدير إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا Subhanaka faqina adaban nar Sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim And Allah's is the kingdom of the heavens and the earth And Allah has power over all things Most surely in the creation of the heavens and the earth And the alternation of the night and the day They are signs for men who understand Those who remember Allah standing and sitting And lying on their sides and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord, you have not created this in vain. Glory be to thee. Save us then from the chastisement of the fire. Sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim. Thank you, Brother Mutaza. Um, we all know that there is a great and magnificent world outside our earth. All the stars, the planets, the supernova, the comets, all of them adorn the empty space that is found outside there. All of this forms the universe that we know today. But, brothers and sisters, like everything else, even these entities are finite beings. There will come a day when all of this will perish. Scientists, during their study of the universe, have come across many things that will help them predict the path of the universe, the future of the universe. And this eventually has led them to formation of theories as to how this universe will come to an end. To discuss these theories forward, I will now call upon our first lecturer for today, Dr. Jiwaji, a person who has great passion in the field of astronomy. Dr. Jiwaji will give us the scientific view of the end of the universe. Uh. You, 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 you heard the end of the universe, but I heard end of the world from Muhammad Reza. So I've titled it end of the world because that's the most common word which comes to your mind. And I started thinking about how do people react when they think of the end, end of the world, you know. So, and you can see that I have qualified it as a scientific understanding of the end of the world because someone who has had a disaster, you know, his whole business went up in flames, some fire broke out, you say, oh, that's the end of the world for me, you know. So that's not perhaps the kind of thing which we want to talk about, uh, to lose, lose a loved one, to have a disaster. Human beings feel personally that they have lost everything and they say, we have, I have, it's the end of the world for me. So the world we are talking about here, perhaps we could have many stages of the end of the world. So what kind of ways can we think of the end of the world? Huh? We can think of, our, we ex, excluding the personal uh, issue. You can think of the world as the earth, or the people and everything that's in it. So that's one view we can look at. And from that view, we can 
talk of the end of the sun as being the source, the primary source of energy for us. So if that ends, the world has to end. Then there is another view of the collision of galaxies. That's something which can happen also. We are going to talk about, we are going to elaborate on this. So there is another option hmm, that takes a little bit longer, five billion years for one, seven billion years for the other. And then we say everything, whatever there is, because even when the galaxies co collide, the, the other parts are still there. So what, have, what, what, what might be possible when everything can be expect to, expected to end? So perhaps there is some number there. These are really some things to just get an impression about the unimaginable amounts of time that we are talking about. So almost there is no end in one way according to the scientific view. So if we take each one at a time, if we look at the end of the sun, the sun, we know, is a source of energy for us, and that energy comes because of nuclear reactions. Nuclear means the nuclei, when we get energy here, when we burn coal, when we burn fuel, we are burning the atoms. The atoms are reacting. On Earth, we say burning means reaction of some combustible material with oxygen. So there's a chemical reaction. But on the sun, the atom consists of a very, very heavy part. The most, the heaviest part is the nucleus. And that is the one which is being used in burning in the sun. And that is what produces energy. So the nuclear fuel can also finish. There's a huge amount, like the, if you look at the mass of the, of the, in terms of volume at least, a million Earths would fit inside the sun. So imagine how many atoms there are inside, inside, in, in, inside there. So the, all the nuclei are, are possible. And it comes of hydrogen and helium, and the hydrogen will fuse into helium, helium will fuse, fuse into lithium, beryllium, etc., until it reaches a stage when it is iron. Once it becomes iron, it cannot release energy. It means any reaction between small, small nuclei will produce energy. But anything bigger than iron, when nuclei fuse, they need energy. So once iron is formed, there is no longer any production of uh, energy, the sun would die. Okay? So up fusion gives off energy up to the creation of iron atoms. Then the next stage now, if you look at uh, the, the, the process, it becomes a red giant. The nuclear fuel is finished. There is nothing to now hold it together. It grows. The, it grows until the orbit, uh, the size of the sun can, can, uh, can encompass, means until it's, it's almost the size of the orbit of the Earth. And I, I'll be showing you those two pictures in more detail, but there is, we'll talk about that. So once the sun becomes huge like that, the fuel then gets finished completely, then there is no longer any heat, thermal uh, energy to keep it big. So once that, it sort of, it cools down, there is a gravitational collapse, we say. The gravi gravity will take over, the whole mass of the sun will collapse onto itself, and with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a star like the sun, it will collapse a, bit, a little bit slowly, although there is, uh, there is a bouncing effect and it produces, it, it will give off uh, material in terms of a nebula, a ring nebula, but uh, the gravitation collapse will cause it to bounce a little bit. The material will bounce, it will spreadly, and then it will cool down. It cools down to a white dwarf. Our sun, Eventually, will cool down to a white dwarf. It is a white dwarf is a very dense material. or oh, everything is cool, and uh, uh, that's the end of it. Basically, it will cool off, and it, it, it is of no use to us. So the other options which are there for uh, other stars, there are nova and supernova, where the explosions are so huge that uh, they are the ones which produce the higher elements from mass, from uh, beyond beyond uh, iron. So, 
uh, all the material that we see that we see here has been produced in nuclear reactions in the sun either during its life itself or during its death during the end of the sun so the process takes about 5 billion years let me show you uh, relative sizes not it's not able to scale you can see how the sun is produced it's a cloud of gas and dust then it becomes it collects together because of uh, gravity it becomes hot because of the uh, compression then it starts the nuclear reaction once it's about more than 10 15 million degrees centigrade nuclear reactions can start so that becomes a star now at the end of this stage means after 5 billion years you can see relatively we are just trying to show a bit relatively the star the yellow part here the yellow sorry i don't think i can yeah we don't have a point the yellow dot there is the sun at the moment and the red giant is the next the next one and eventually when that cools it produces a very small dot called the white dwarf and maybe this next picture may be a bit more uh, easy to appreciate the size of the red giant so the red giant is only a small part of the red giant is shown there the size of the red giant is there the current sun is there and that is that is to scale now the earth is just a small dot so imagine what would happen when the sun will cover us of course there won't be anything left on earth so that's one end of our world another is the collision of galaxies uh, nearby galaxies there is a galaxy called the andromeda galaxy which is about 2 billion light years away that means light which is moving at uh, 300,000 kilometers uh, sorry uh, 300,000 kilometers per second light which is moving at 300,000 kilometers per second in each second it moves 300,000 kilometers it takes 2 billion years 2 million years 2 million light years it takes 2 million light years for the nearest galaxy to I mean for, uh, for, for light to come from the nearest so that galaxy is actually approaching us now so that approach will take about 7 billion years it is that far away if you do the calculations you get 7 billion years for the two galaxies our galaxy our sun we are in the milky way galaxy and the andromeda galaxy and uh, the uh, milky way galaxy are expected to meet and since the center of galaxies are made up of black holes you can expect anything to happen there so that's another end we can imagine so that takes about 7 billion years so here I'm going to show you some pictures of galaxies that are already viewed by Hubble for example space telescopes Hubble space telescopes, they have viewed galaxy galaxies colliding the first picture there is almost the two galaxies are almost together there the other one is they are still a little bit apart so there are things happening in when you, when you look in the skies you can see such things already happening also so for us the andromeda and the milky way can collide is going uh, is going to collide it is on a collision course then the other thing is now we are talk, we are not talking of our local environment we talked about ourselves we talked about our earth we talked about the sun we talked about the galaxy now we are talking of the universe now universe means everything in it everything is there any end to that so for that people are viewing the evidence scientists do that they see what is happening and they think about what could happen they measure they take measurements they have some ideas they test them they refine them and at the moment there are about four options there about what can happen to the universe whether is there any end or not so for that you can see a small figure there of 50 billion years so there is expected to be an end there are some scenarios where things will not end but if it ends it will take about 50 billion years one among one or two among the four that I mentioned so now I'll go through the four now so the first scenario the first scenario is the big freeze means everything will cool down and 
It's no heat at all, nothing left. Why is that? When we look at our universe, although here on, on Earth we can see huh, fire, we can see water is 100 degrees centigrade, fire will be maybe at maybe 2000 degrees centigrade. Uh, things are at very hot. But if you look at the universe as a whole, when you look at the universe as a whole, when you just try to understand the temperature of our space, then we see that the temperature uh, can, be, uh, can be determined by seeing the radiation that's coming from space. Because everything, anything which is hot has to give out energy. We are also ourselves giving out energy. The more people there are, the more warmer this room will be. So we'll need higher, high, you know, higher air conditioning, for example. So everything is giving off energy. And energy in the form of radiation. We can also give out energy by convection also. The air is also getting hotter, etc. But it's the radiation energy we are talking about here. Uh, for example, we are giving out energy in the infrared spectrum. The sun, although we say it is hot, it's not actually hot in terms of the radiation. The radiation that's coming out is just like this light. The light energy, which is a higher form of energy, is coming from the sun. We give off infrared, infrared energy, which is invisible energy. And if, you, uh, if you put a hand in front of a on the, on the side of a stove, you will still feel the heat. That's when you keep it on, on top, it's the convective heat which you are seeing. But when you keep it on the side, if you feel the heat, it is the radiative heat. So that's infrared energy, infrared uh, radi electromagnetic radiation. That's coming from hot objects. We are giving off infrared, very long infrared. We are giving, because we are, we are only at about maybe 20, 25, 30 degrees, our surface temperature will be that. So when we look now at the universe, when we measure the energy, when we look at the radiation, the radiation is in a microwave. If you know the electromagnetic spectrum, the, it ranges from microwaves to gamma rays. So if you go from microwaves to gamma rays, you are, you are having higher and higher energy. As you go towards the microwave, you get lower and lower energy. Lower and lower energy is, is, is equivalent to an object that's giving off energy at a lower temperature. So that temperature of the universe at the moment is about three degrees Kelvin, three degrees above absolute zero. So, if you want to talk about, I know some people, some uh, some students may already have seen negative uh, uh, negative 273 degrees centigrade as being the lowest temperature that something can reach. So we call that zero, absolute zero. Means no heat, no energy, zero energy is absolute zero. In terms of our degree centigrade, we are, our body temperature is about 40 degrees 40 degree centigrade. Absolute zero is negative 273. Like liquid nitrogen or something like that will be maybe negative 200 degrees centigrade, etc. So negative 273 degrees centigrade means there is no heat at all. So we are only three degrees above our universe. It is at a stage where it is only three degrees above really no energy at all. So now what happened here now? See, when something is cold, if it is radiating energy, and we know, for example, that the universe is expanding, we work backwards and we said here that the universe must have begun with a hot start. The hot start that it started with was, was, was termed the Big Bang. So it's like an unimaginable type of explosion, and it starts from there. And then from there it cools. If you have a if you have a hot object there, if you put something hot uh, on a on 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 a table, it will cool off. So your, your 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 if you have hot water, it will eventually cool to room temperature. So our room temp our room temperature for the universe, imagine, is zero. So eventually everything has to cool. Now the picture which I'm <coughs> trying to show you here is to show you how. Oh wait, what happened? Did it go forward? Yeah, yeah sorry. Now, the, uh, the, other, the other point that we need to make here is that uh, there is no way that the cold object can become hot on its own. This, there is a natural law called the second law of thermodynamics which talks about disorder, entropy or disorder. Disorder can never become order without putting in more energy. So if there is no source of energy, Everything has to just become disorderly. Means everything will, will now here you arrange, 
maybe when you get up, you become, you are mixing up, so it becomes a disorder. So that's the idea that on its own, a universe can only become disordered. Disordered means lower and lower temperature. And lower temperature means it reaches eventually absolute zero. That's what we call the big freeze or the heat death. Means there is no, no longer any. That's one scenario. The picture which I wanted to show here was to show you how much when people measure the whole universe, they, they, they pointed the, the meters around, uh, across all parts of the sky and within 0.002 degrees Kelvin, you can see it's in the third decimal that it is that exact a value. There is no doubt that the universe is very cold. Only three degrees, nearly three degrees Kelvin. And this is a picture of some variations in parts of the, of the whole view of the universe. These are, these, are real, these are real measurements which are shown here. <coughs> okay, then the second scenario. That was, the first one was the big, the, the big freeze. Everything has to cool down and then now there, there is nothing. I mean, it's just there, but there is no, it's zero, absolute zero means there is nothing. Then there's the big crunch. What do you mean by big crunch? Now the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding in the sense that, and, 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 and we are, we are, we are, when, we look, when we look at the expansion itself, we see that farther objects, the more distant an object is, the faster it is moving away from us. That's called the Hubble law. And, uh, but when they measure now the rate of expansion, if the expansion was to slow down because of gravity, because gravity is still there, there is something which has been exploded, it is now flying all over, and now gravity is still there when the expansion is relatively slow, gravity can still pull it back. So if gravity pulls it back, then all the matter is pulled back and eventually we go back to where we started, the Big Bang, but now it becomes the opposite. It becomes a big crunch sort of. So that is another end we can imagine, that everything is pulled in. Actually, these are again the time frames of 50 billion years. So uh, this, is the, this is the picture just showing you all the matter, eventually because of gravity, because there is nothing else to pull, 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 push, it, pull, uh, push it apart, it just goes back because of gravity to, uh, to a point, to a singularity, to a single point, uh, like a black hole. Now the third scenario, if you, look, you want to think of the third scenario, imagine that instead of it being now lost, once everything is at one point, it could be a black hole, you might imagine if, if I mean, we don't want to go too much into what it, but black hole means it will just absorb everything. But you can imagine that the black hole now reacts and it's like restarting what we call the Big Bang because we had a Big Bang to start with, let's say. So this is like everything coming together and then the whole thing bouncing back means it went to a point and that is again a point where, so people think that, scientists think that this is a cyclic thing. It expands and contracts to a single point, again the Big Bang again, it contracts again, so this is a cyclic process. So that's, a, here we would say the universe doesn't end, although things will be disturbed, we can imagine after a, going into a single point, uh, it will be a new people and new, new everything, you know. So, although it, it, everything doesn't end, here in a scenario like this, we can say it just goes on forever. The fourth scenario. The fourth scenario is that people have noticed, in fact, that instead of the expansion slowing down, because if there is no longer any, any, any energy, the expansion should uh, slow down. Actually, they have found that the expansion rate is increasing. Again, these are measurements. And these are scientists. These are people. These are instruments they are using. So, lots of work is going on. Some people have noticed that the, expand, that the, the rate of expansion of the universe is increasing, means it's expanding at a faster rate. If that was to happen, uh, we, we, we allow, we, you know, people don't know why it is happening, so they call it dark energy. You can see even the word itself is like they don't know anything, everything is in the dark. So there's something which is, which is making it go forward. 
the rate of expansion increasing, atoms, nuclei, the, the parts of the nuclei, the quarks, everything has to just come apart because everything is expanding. If the universe is expanding, everything in it has to expand. So then it will go into nothingness. So here is an end here. We can see one scenario where the universe has ended because everything has been torn apart. Now, maybe we can just try to picture this, you see. If this was a flat, if our world was flat, like a carpet like this, then we might imagine that the carpet goes on smoothly throughout, is like a zero curvature, they call it. It's a big freeze type of situation. Eventually, everything will cool down, and that's the end of it. Now, if because of gravity and because if there is enough mass, you can have a big crunch. Means, imagine a, a instead of a carpet, it becomes it the, the, the like a if you take if you take a drop of water or a bubble, for example, it will try to make become a, 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 a sphere. So, this sphere can grow and collapse and grow and collapse. So this might be the big crunch or the big bounce. So if it, if it collapses completely, the, 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 the ball collapses completely to a point, that's the big crunch. And if it collapses and then bounces back and forth and back, so this is like a two-dimensional view of what we are talking about. Our world is three-dimensional and in fact four, four dimensions perhaps or even more dimensions we, people are thinking about. But if it's a two-dimensional picture, we would see a big crunch, you could picture it like a ball, which is expanding and contracting. Now, in terms of the big rip, big rip is where everything is expanding out of control. You can see, imagine, it's like you are tearing the carpet apart. Every point in the carpet is being torn apart. Eventually, nothing is left. So that's a kind of view which you can, you can also have. Um, why are there so many options? Scientists, when a lot of people are working on this and everybody has the right to think of you know, in their own way because the total mass of the universe is not easy to ascertain accurately at the moment. I'll talk about that soon. There is evidence of, of dark matter. We said dark energy first, but there is a dark matter means 95% of of the mass in the universe, you can't see it. What we see means when we look at the sun and all the space, the visible thing means we, that we, what we can detect. Visible means not only by the eyes, radio telescopes or X-ray image, X-ray telescope, everything. If you look at everything, only 5% is visible. 95% of the universe, nobody can see. You just they can't, they can see the effects. They can see there must be something there because they, when they look at the rotation of galaxies, the galaxies are rotating as if it had more mass than what you see. So that is another problem about. So there is this evidence of dark matter. This is the accelerating expansion which I talked about. So there are so many unknowns here. So people then, so, so from, if you look at the current mass of the universe, I don't know if I have, we are at a point of time where all options are possible. Let me put this next picture, I think, yeah. This next picture here, you can see the, I don't know if I can take this out for a while. We are, we are at this stage here. If you look at this point here, all the, all the options are plotted, every distance between galaxies, when you plot it against, uh, against time, for all these options, then you will see that we are at a point of time where all those options are possible. We are not before that time, if our forefathers had been measuring the universe earlier, we might have been here, we might have been able to detect which one of the universe might be the truth. Or later on, after maybe another hundred million years, you might be able to see perhaps some difference and be able to decide which of the options may work out. But currently, currently, we say we don't know what will happen. People have options, but really we don't know what will happen. Thank you very much. We will now uh, entertain any questions for Dr. Jivaji, if at all there are any.
gravity and how, how effective it is. You see, when you talk of gravity, gravity is a, such a minor force, even when you are sitting, when you, when you are sitting next to each other, gravity is pulling you. But I mean, if you try to measure that, that, that amount of pull, it's, it's almost negligible. Yet, it is causing all these things to happen. Once there is, there is nothing else around, when everything is free, then gravity is a significant force. Uh, I've seen some ladies with questions. Yes, please. When the energy has run out, the, the reactions, the nuclear reactions are no longer taking place. So actually there are inside, in, on, the, on the inner core, there are reactions taking place, but the outside is left to itself. So it just grows because there is nothing now holding it together because the, the, the nuclear reactions are not taking place. So the, 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 the size of the sun increases and when the size of the sun increases and the temperature is low, the, the color, I mean red is a low energy radiation. If you look at the electromagnetic, so that's called a red, red giant. They... Yeah, so the collapse here will not be as dramatic. There are other parts. In, in this collapse here, eventually when, when, when everything, when there is no energy at all, it will, gravity has to take over. But it will be like a, like a more gentle collapse. A gentle collapse with a gentle bounce. And we say a ring nebula. I don't know if you have seen pictures but of other, play, other suns where there is material around it and in the middle there is a white dwarf. You see a white dwarf and then so that's a bounce, a gentle bounce. But if it was more, uh, the size of the sun is bigger, then the collapse is more energetic, we get supernova and things like that. It's a very informative uh, lecture. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent the Prophet and the Holy Book for our guidance. All this came to warn us of some signs. One of the signs, again, which they warned us of was death. Death of humans, death of the universe. So in the Holy Quran, there are also some verses which indicate towards the end of the universe and how it will occur. To discuss more on this a religious viewpoint of the end of the universe. May I now call upon uh, Dr. Ali Dina, our resident alim, who has studied in Qum for more than 10 years. Sheikh Ali Dina. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad. وآله الطاهرين Respected elders, scholars, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah The Holy Quran in its discussion about the next life and the beginning of the next life based on the end of this current physical world has devoted a huge amount of discussion and space which is amazing and uh, compared to other scriptures definitely it is in greater detail according to some scholars there are more than a thousand verses discussing about the next world and a substantial portion of this talks about the end of this physical world. So you're talking almost about a sixth of the Qur'an devoted to this important topic. And secondly, you must note that a true believer is not sincere, his belief is not complete if he rejects the belief in life after death. And number three, when Allah describes His servants, uh, the holy servants, the saintly, godly servants, He praises them with one particular quality, and that is their remembrance of the next life. So, for example, in Surah Sa'd, chapter 38, ayah number 45 and 6, 
واذكر عبدنا ابراهيم واسحاق ويعقوب اولي الايدي والابصار او بروفيت remember the example the story the lifestyle the belief the principles of these past prophets ibrahim ishaq and yaqub what's so great about them ulil aidi wal absar they were powerful and they had vision not only they had material vision but more important they had spiritual vision not only they could see ahead and plan ahead and they had wisdom but they had also insight they had also spiritual reflection What is it that made them outstanding, O Prophet? The next ayah then says, Inna akhlasnahum bi khalisatin. We have selected them, we have purified them, we have chosen them. And we granted them one pure exclusive quality, and that is dhikradar, the remembrance of the next abode. That's the distinguishing feature of the godly chosen servants these are prophets and these are presented as an example to our prophet and of course through our prophet to us or for example in surah ali imran chapter 3 ayah number 190 191 onwards 190 onwards allah praises those believers who ponder who reflect and who try to decipher a purpose in creation and that purpose and that search for purpose and meaning in life definitely leads them to the remembrance of life hereafter in fi khalqi as-samawati wal ard wa ikhtilaf al-layl wa an-nahar la ayati li uli al-albab surely in the creation of the heavens and the earth the design the wonder the arrangement the harmony the laws of the heavens and the earth and for example in the alteration of the day and night the cycle the periodic cycle and the change of the day and night specifically there are clear signs there are many signs elsewhere but these these are important ones there are signs for those who are men of understanding men here obviously including uh, women mankind those members of mankind who have deeper understanding who ponder who reflect who are not like those in surah yasin uh, who are condemned that they see so many signs they pass by it but they just simply ignore they neglect they don't ponder and reflect chapter 36 ayah number 46 wama ta'tihim min ayatin min ayati rabbihim illa kanu anha mu'ridin the problem with these people is many signs are shown to them they look at them but they just pass by and they don't learn they don't ponder they don't reflect so those of deeper understanding they search for signs they ponder and reflect and what do they do alladhina yadhkuruna allaha qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila subhanak faqina adhab an-nar and because they see the signs of god everywhere the very fabric of the universe is such that it demonstrates and displays god's power god's wisdom god's majesty god's love god's mercy therefore they always see these signs and therefore they remember god and they remember god not only when they see these signs but they remember god in all stages of their lives in all states of their life be they standing or sitting or sleeping and they ponder and they say oh lord You have not created this in vain. There's a purpose. Exalted are you to play games. This wonderful creation, majestic, marvelous, wonderful, has a purpose. مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ So, based on this perspective, therefore, when you look at the universe, one clear indication according to the Qur'an, in the universe is the nature of the design of the universe or the makeup of the universe is such that it is moving towards decline it is moving towards a phase where it will die amazing um, in the quran when there's discussion about the events that will happen in the future interestingly enough allah talks in the past tense 
So for example, the surahs of Taqweer, chapter 81. And remember the time when the sun will be folded up. Or chapter 82, surah Infitar. Remember the time when the skies will split or break. Um, or in Surah in Shikaq, chapter 84, <laughs> all past tense. These are examples. When do you talk in past tense and you're referring to the future? Only in one situation. You know the future. You have seen the future. The future has, according to you, is so clear, it's so certain, it's so unavoidable, it is as if it's the past. It's happened. It's so definite. It's so clear. So according to the Quran, there's no doubt about this ending of the universe. And then to emphasize the different aspects of how this end will take place, if you look at the verses that talk about the changes in the sky, one, the changes in the earth, two, the changes in the mountain, three, the changes in the sea, four, the changes in the sun and the moon, five and six, all of this indicate that there are systematic, sequential changes that will take place which will bring about the end of the physical universe and the ushering of a totally different new world with a different set of laws, with a different type of earth, a different type of the heavens. So for example, in uh, Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, ayah number 48, Allah says, remember the time when the earth will change and the heavens will change. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضُ the earth will change to another earth, not this earth. Different type of earth, different laws, different constitution, different composition, different characteristics. What's Samawatu? And the same thing with the heavens. Heavens will change another set of heavens, another set of laws, characteristics, composition. And the end result of all these cataclysmic physical changes will be Man, all of them, without exception, will come out in the open, manifest, hidden, in the final encounter with their Lord. All these physical changes are a preliminary step to bring about this final encounter. But the interesting thing about the Quran is it gives glimpses into the details of these changes. So let's have a look at some of these changes. So for example, look at the sun. The Quran talks about the sun that it is created like the moon bihusban. It's created in such a way that it moves in an exact fashion, well calculated, precise. Or the sun is described as diya, a source of light and energy and heat therefore. And the moon as a reflecting body. But other than these verses, there are two other verses that talk about the end of the sun. So, in Surah, or well, interestingly, it's not one uh, ayah, several ayah keep on repeating this. So, in Surah Ra'd, chapter 13, ayah 2, Surah Luqman, chapter 31, ayah 29, Surah Fatir, chapter 35, ayah 13, Surah Zumar, chapter 39, ayah 5, Allah says he's the one who is created and subjugated and uh, made the sun and the moon follow certain physical laws but not indefinitely. They're not created to be working for an indefinite period of time. It's a pre-designed, pre-ordained, fixed term and period. Once that is over, the sun and the moon are going to decline and disappear. Not once, several times Allah declares that. But how is the sun going to disappear? There's only one ayah. Surah Taqwiyan, chapter 81. And when the sun will be folded up. This is one translation. Um, different 
authors have translated or translators have interpreted this differently. Some say when the sun folded up, some say when the sun, sun is wound up or sun is made to cease to shine, the sun will be extinguished, the sun will be darkened, the sun will be rolled, the sun will be rotated. Some translators have said when the sun is overthrown or the sun implodes. One word, and look at different translators coming out different interpretations, because a word has been used in the Quran to describe an entity in terms that are not familiar to the ordinary mind. So a term has been used and everyone tries to understand according to his level of comprehension. Takwir, uh, kuwira, kawr is, for example, somebody takes an amama or a turban and he uh, folds it up on his head. That is called takwir, for example, kawr. So that's why, and when the sun will be folded up or when it will be wound up. But folded up and wound up as if to say that now it has completed its work and you keep it aside. Or, no, another meaning of takwir is to throw it away, overthrown, or therefore it will implode. Or no, when the sun will be made to roll and rotate. Question. Is there anything to describe, anything to enable us to understand about the future of the sun? About the manner of its decline and its death, which can fit this particular description? That's the big challenge. Because the subsequent verses then talk about the decline of the stars. And when the mountains will be made to move. And when the stars will fade away or will dim or will be blotted out. Some scholars have tried to interpret this ayah to mean that the sun basically is made up of layers. Um, the science of helioseismology has studied the different layers of the sun. So you have a core and then outside the core is the radiation zone and then, then there is a convection zone and finally there is the photosphere. So the core is where the temperatures will be as high as 16 million degrees centigrade. That's where the nuclear fusion takes place, which is the basis of the production of the energy. And then you have the radiation zone, 2.5 million centigrade. And then you have the convection zone, 2 million degrees centigrade temperature. And finally, the outer photosphere, which is only about 5,500, ah, only in, <laughs> compared to the sun, but to us, it's dangerously hot. Um, the sun is going to be folded up. Is it referring to these layers collapsing? Is it referring to the process of the energy production now reaching its end stage? The sun, definitely the scientists discovered early on, given the size of the sun, before this uh, theory of nuclear fusion uh, was postulated. Before that, the only source of energy or the production of light and heat was using fossil fuels. You burn up coal or wood, you produce heat and light for yourself. They said, look at the size of the sun. If at all it was made up of coal or wood or something similar, within a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of years, the sun would have burnt out. There must be some other process of heat and energy production. And then in the early part of the 20th century, they came up with the discovery of nuclear uh, physics. And now they explain that it is the hydrogen atom at the nuclear level, the protons stripped off the electrons, and then they combine, and they form, the four of them form one heliumite, uh, one helium nucleus, and a little mass in the process is lost, which according to Einstein's theory then is converted into energy according to the formula of E is equal to mc squared and hence this huge massive production of heat and energy and light. Well that's the theory of the 21st, early part of the 20th century. But even that theory doesn't mean the sun can produce indefinitely light and heat and energy. Alright, so now you've expanded the sun's life from a few tens of thousands of years 
to a few billion years. Seven billion years is the estimate. They say the sun right now is in its middle age. There's a few more billion years before it begins to die. And the death of the stars has already been observed elsewhere. For example, the spectacular explosion of the supernova. And there's the sun being an average star compared to other hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Galaxy, in the Milky Way Galaxy. And, and the Milky Way Galaxy is just an example of hundreds of billions of other galaxies. So they've observed the death of stars elsewhere. The sun is an average star, and therefore they predict the sun is un going to undergo the same process of death as the other stars have undergone. So this ayah of the Quran, in the shamsu kuwirat, can be interpreted to explain a manner of death of the sun, which the scientists have observed as already taking place in the other stars. Once the sun begins to die, a process that will take
planets in the solar system. Sky could refer to beyond the solar system, the, the, the stars and, and the galaxy. But the Quran describes in different surahs what is going to happen to the sky. So in chapter 52, ayah number 9, Allah says, and you'll begin to see the sky shake and tremble and violently move, number one. Or in Surah Mursala, chapter 77, ayah number 9, Allah says, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فُرِجَتْ Farj is an opening. And you'll find openings appearing in the sky. Or in, in Fitar, Allah says, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ When the sky begins to break up, gravity, the whole of gravity now is becoming weak. Or in Surah in Shiqaq, chapter 84, ayah 1, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ It will split open. Or in uh, Surah Rahman, فَإِذَا شَقَّتُ السَّمَاءُ when the sky is going to split open and break up, you will notice that it will become red, crim crim crimson red, just like rose. فَإِذَا شَقَّتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ وَرْدَةً كَدِّهَانٌ In fact, as clear as the oil, red, like the oil, or in Surah 69, Surah Haqqa, Allah says again, when the sky will be split up, فَكَانَتْ wahia, It will become weakened, again, referring to the gravity. Or no, in Surah Ma'arij, when the changes happen in the sky, so it will be just like molten lead. Chapter 70 is Surah Ma'arij, ayah number 8. Allah says, يَوْمَ تَكُونُ السَّمَاءُ كَالْمُهُلْ Just like molten, molten metal, the sky will be burning and the sky will be red. So notice the different descriptions made of the stars, of the planets, of the sky. That number one, they'll be weakening. They will be opening, they will be scattering, they will be breaking up, they will be trembling, they will be reddening of the sky. Again, all of this can be explained on the observations that have been made by astronomers about the life cycle of a star. How is a star born when the clouds of matter cluster together and then under the force of gravity triggered by some event they begin to collapse and when it reaches a critical mass, a star is born, and around the stars you'll have the planets, and this star generates energy over time when this fuel and the energy uh, sources are used up and depleted, the star begins to die. The death process, as has been observed by the scientists, um, this corresponds beautifully to the description given in the Quran. So, in addition to the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky, the third description of the changes is of the mountains. In the Quran, different descriptions have been given about the changes to the mountain. So for example, in chapter 20, Surah Taha, ayah number 105, if everything is going to change, what about these most solid, strong structures that we see around? And these are the mountains. What's going to happen to them? Ayah number 105. Yes, anil jibali. They come and ask you repeatedly what's going to happen to the mountains. Faqul yansifuha rabbi nasfa. Allah will uproot them, a complete uprooting, the mountains. فَيَذَرُهَا قَاعًا صَفْصَفَا Once the mountains have been uprooted, you'll find the earth to become a flattened plateau. Or according to the American translator, it'll become a prairie. لَا تَرَى فِيهَا عِوَجًا وَلَا أَمْتَى 
You shall find no crookedness or unevenness on the flattened earth after the mountains have been removed. Number one. Number two, in Surah Haqqa, chapter 69, ayah number 14, Allah describes the change that's going to happen to the mountains in that they will crumble. They will be uprooted and they will crumble. وَحُمِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالُ فَدُكَّتَا دَكَّتًا وَاحِدًا And you'll find the earth lifted and the mountains lifted فَدُكَّتَا And they shall be made to crush دُكَّتًا وَاحِدًا دَكَّتًا وَاحِدًا One single extensive massive uh, crushing Or in Surah Waqi'a chapter 56 Ayah number Five وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّا And the mountains shall be crushed to small dust particles. Or in Surah Muzzammil, chapter 73, ayah number 15, Allah says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالُ وَكَانَتِ الْجِبَالُ كَثِيبًا مَهِيلًا and the day when the earth will be made to shake violently and the mountains and you'll find the mountains mountains will crumble to dust and will be heaped up as a collection of sand and dust no longer solid no longer strong and firm potential picture this is how probably it could happen shaking of the earth one lifting of the mountains two moving of the mountains three Crushing of the mountains, four. Crashing of the mountains, crushing of the mountains. Becoming a pile of sand. No, becoming as soft as wool. No. Becoming a mirage. It's not there anymore. Finally, it's a flattened earth. Cataclysmic changes that will take place in a proportion which we have never seen before. Of course, associated with these mountain changes are the changes to the earth. إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ Or the change that will happen إِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ The violent, tremendous changes that will be global on the earth. Or the changes that will happen to the sea. In Surah 81, which is Surah Taqweer, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ And remember the time when the seas will, made, will be made to overflow, or will, will be boiling, or will be burning the seas. Or in Surah Tur, Allah says, وَالْبَحْرِ الْمَسْجُورِ And I swear by the sea, the water which will be burning. Or in Surah Infitar, chapter 82, ayah number 3, and remember when the seas will split or overflow, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ fujirat, not sujirat, they will explode. Again, this is not difficult to appreciate the explosion and the burning and the fire in the sea in, according to the tectonic plate theory mm -hmm. and that there is molten lava beneath the crust of the earth and incidentally most of these tectonic plates are buried in the oceans they're lesser on the dry land and therefore there is every possibility if this Pangaea theory is right that in, in the beginning the earth was all one massive land mass and then it split and then it separated and now we have the continents and if you look at the contour and the outline, let's say, of the western border of Africa and the eastern border of South America, somehow they're contiguous. So at one time they were together and now they're split. But if they've split and they're still moving away, and if it took several tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years to reach this point, give the next ten millions or a few hundreds of millions of years and this separation at the rate of let's say an inch a year continues 
and you'll have another Pangea forming in the future. And the, and the Quran is saying that, uh, remember when the oceans will overflow, or no, when the oceans will explode. So if the tectonic plates allow the lava or the molten, uh, the molten metal core of the earth to flow out, we can easily appreciate the end to the seas. And finally, the Quran, in conclusion, likes to emphasize that the one important motivator and the powerful motivator to good and the powerful deterrent from evil for man is to remember the end. Man drifts away in life, man forgets the higher purpose and then begins to think about himself and his immediate selfish interests when he forgets the higher purpose, when he forgets the goal, when he forgets the next life. The emphasis in the Quran is, remember, physical changes are going to take place at a scale which is so cataclysmic you can't escape if you're on the earth. But as some astronomers, as some scientists are already planning, we want to go and colonize space. We want to land in Mars. And then, and then maybe in the next few centuries, leave the solar system. And then maybe in the next uh, few centuries, land in the closest star and maybe find planets there which are habitable. Good enough. So you have escaped the earth or you have escaped the solar system. The changes being referred to here are universal. Is throughout the globe. Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins. In istata'atum an tanfuzu min akbar samawati wal-ardi fanfuzu. If you think you can escape and penetrate right till the ends of the universe and you, and you escape God's reach and God's power, do so. La tanfuzu illa bi sultan. You need authority, you need power, you need energy, and you don't have it. Let's pray to God to get tawfiq, to be able to keep this scenario of the future, the earth and the seas, and the mountains and the sun, and the moon and the stars, always in mind as the Quran keeps on reminding us. And through that, motivate ourselves to do good, through that, develop a strong deterrent from evil and an aspiration for that higher life. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Closing and ask them while the others have proceeded for the refreshments. On behalf of the Astronomy Subcommittee of the Debating Society, I would I wish to extend our sincere appreciation and heartfelt gratitude to our two lecturers of today. Dr. Jivaji and Sheikh Ali Dina for the interesting lectures. I'm sure both of you must have took tremendous effort preparing them and obviously you have sacrificed your Saturday evening for us. Uh, we appreciate that a lot.